thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the conference organizers to uh, invite me. Um, uh, what I'll be presenting is an overview of the research we've been doing since started about 2002. Um, so what, why did we get, why did I start this? This started out, because we have a, a master's program in project management, which is for practitioners. There's people typically in their 30s that work in real organizations and come to the university in the evening. So they know about the real organizations, so you can't tell them anything that doesn't match their reality. After about half an hour, they'll say, hey, that's not how it goes. So what are you going to tell these people? Young people, you can tell them anything. They just take the notes. Is it on the exam? I'm sure that's OK. But when you're teaching practitioners, uh, you have to say things that are true. And I was teaching a course. We were, I was, PMO was on this course. And we'd started done some research, actually, in the late 90s on PMOs. So, uh, and I was reading what the, what the literature, and the literature was all produced by consultants. And what I was reading in the literature did not fit the reality. And of course, you can't tell them things they know are not true. So that's actually this started in 19, 2002. I had a group of students. There were 17 students. And 11 of those students had a PMO in their organization. So we did a workshop, and we described their PMOs, how they really were. They were all different. And none of them fit what was in the literature. So this was actually the starting point of what was a long quest to try to understand. First, to understand what PMOs are really like, not what people think they should be, and to try to find an explanation for uh, the way they are. And we thought this was going to be simple. We'll do a survey, and we'll figure it all out, and it'll end. And we're still searching for a, a good explanation. We've discovered many things along the way, and I'll share some of that with you. But we haven't find, found the final explanation, and we're still looking, which is great for a researcher, because you can keep on doing research, and you have enough interesting things to invite you to conferences, but you will, when it's, there's no end in sight uh, with respect to this research. So that's, that's uh, why I got involved in this. I was also a member of, a member of PMI in North America, the early association in North America. And in the early uh, 2000s, I was on their standards committee, which does standards. And the, the members were asking for a standard on PMOs. But standards are based on consensus. And there's no consensus. So what do you do? You wait. It's now uh, 2010, still no consensus, still no standard. But um, PMI uh, realized I did this survey, and they asked me to write a white paper, and I'll give you the reference in a minute. So that white paper, because in their mind, if you don't have enough knowledge to do a standard, you do a technical report, and if you don't have enough stuff for a technical report, you do a white paper. So the white paper was just describing the reality, and we haven't been able to move beyond that in terms of standards because there is no consensus. So that was part of the, the why I, I started doing this. In 2002, 2003, the literature was dominated by the, 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 the consultant literature, which at the time said there are, everybody had a model. It was about, you know, typically four PMOs, A, B, C, D, but if you're really good, you'll have a D. So there was really only one really good PMO. In fact, uh, Michael Oberg, there's, I, we, I have a, we have a, a chapter in the book you received that when you registered, and Michael has a, his colleagues have a chapter after it. And within his paper, you'll see a table that presents some of those models. So that was, this, that was the literature at the time. It's changed since then. Uh, they're not saying anymore there are only four types. It's, the, I think, partly because of reality, and maybe because of our influence, they are saying well, it's quite varied, really. So that was, that's how this thing uh, got started. And um, the definition of a PMO, this is, this is the one we adopted, and I checked later, it turned out to be the same one PMI was using. It's really, really open definition. It's an organizational unit that does some project management things for a group of projects and might not be called a PMO. So within that definition, many, many, many different forms could fit. Anything more precise tends to be inaccurate. You see anything a PMO is, and it's probably wrong most of the time because there's some others that are not. Or if you say a PMO does this, yes, some do, but others do a lot of other things. So there, when you try to make a more precise definition, it, it doesn't fit the reality very well. So we've stuck with a very open definition. In our studies, we excluded single project PMOs, PMOs that manage one project. Not because it's not interesting, but we thought it was probably different. So we really looked at PMOs that deal with multiple projects. And this started out as a research project in uh, 2004, 2005, and turned into a research program with a series of projects. And uh, what I'll be presenting today is an overview of the results of those. 
the, the chapter that's in the book you received when you registered is a summary presentation of this whole research program and all the different projects and some of the things we've found. And in the bibliography, you'll find references. We've had several publications on this. But this started out uh, 2004, 2006 uh, with a survey. And we, we had 500 we had descriptions of 500 PMOs around the world. There was a big enough European sample that we could talk about Europe as well. And uh, had a very extensive questionnaire. And what the objective was was just describe how they are. I don't care how they should be, just tell me how they are. So I had a description and I had very, a lot of information about the organizational context, the projects, the, and the PMOs. And this was a big database that we, we exploited. And one of the, that was what PMO, PMI knew I had this and they asked me to write a white paper. But the white paper is easy to get if you know how to get it, but difficult to get, find if you don't. Um, PMI for a long time had it on their website and anybody in the world could download it free. But recently they decided only members could have access. But PMI is a bureaucracy, and bureaucracies do funny things. It's elsewhere on their website, and they don't know it. So if you put Hobbes PMO or PMO Hobbes in Google, you'll find it. Um, and it, I'd suggest if you want to know about this, the, at least this part of the research, you do that. It's, it's uh, written for practitioners. There's one finding per page with about this many, this many bullet points and a graphic, so you can read it in about 20 minutes. And uh, so it's quite accessible so that all of the, de I won't present any of the, de much of the detail on that survey here. I suggest if you're interested, that's readily available, uh, both in terms of downloading, but also in terms of, you know, it doesn't take very long to read because it's bullet points and, and graphics. So, so have a look at that. That's what I have indicated up here. Problem with colorblind people, we can't see these red dots. But anyway, there. This search for PMO uh, Hobbs or Hobbs PMO in Google, and you'll find that. So, and from that, we discovered that there's a huge amount of variety, and we were not able to explain the variety with the contextual variables. So we thought maybe it must be inside the organization that the dynamics are driving these PMOs. One of the important things we discovered then was most PMOs change. We have a PMO, it's a period of stability from maybe two to four years, and then it changes to something else. And what's driving this change? We couldn't find anything in the, in the context. It's the internal dynamics that are driving. My colleague, Monique Aubry, is a, she's a, had a career as a senior project manager in a bank. She worked in a PMO for 10 years, but not as a PMO staff, but as a senior project manager. And she did our master's degree. She was teaching courses in our university, and then she decided to do a PhD. So the second project up here is her PhD thesis. And what she looked at was four in-depth historic case studies of organizations that have had PMOs over a period of time, and she traced the transitions from one to the next. What was driving the changes? Uh, then, and. These two pieces, her thesis and the survey results, have been published by PMI in a, in a, in a book. Because um, we have, we've had, PMI Research Department funds research. And there are three of these projects that have been funded by PMI. And when, you've, when PMI funds a research project, they give you some money. And then you write a research report, which is quite detailed. And they put that on their website. If you're a member of PMI, you get access free of charge. If not, you can buy it. We don't get any revenue. PMI gets a little bit, but they sell it for about 30 or $40. But if you want the enormous detail of all of this, it's readily available on the PMI uh, website. So that was, that was published uh, actually in April this year. Um, the next thing we did was come from, from the original survey, we learned that PMIs are transitory, they change. And from her, uh, doctoral thesis, we had an idea of what were the dynamics around that change. So the third uh, phase of this research project, is, uh, which is down here, um, PMO is in transition. This is another project financed by PMI. On this project, Ralph Mueller and Thomas Blumquist joined in on the team. Um, and here, what we're looking at is the unit of analysis has changed. We had a PMO. Describe it. Why did you change it? And what was it like afterwards? And what was the impact of this change? So that was, it's not the, it's two descriptions plus the change. Why do we, why did they change so much? That monograph is, we'll finish it next week, but PMI takes a long time to publish and it'll take about a year before it's actually available. Um, and Monique and Ralph have another project in which I'm not involved. What they're doing looking at here, this is, to date we've always looked at one PMO. Many big organizations have many PMOs. So the unit of analysis here is a big organization that has several PMOs. What are the relationships amongst these PMOs? What are the different PMOs doing as a community of PMOs within a large corporation? 
And that, will, that study will finish in early 2011, and of course PMI will take a year to publish it, so sometime in 2012 uh, that will come out. And uh, the, the, as I said, I think the chapter that's in the book you received is an overview of this research program and the different projects uh, with some of the detail that I won't be presenting today is there. Um, so the beginning of this was the survey. What was the objective? The objective was to describe how are PMOs in reality. And it's descriptive, not prescriptive. It's a distinction that's important. And, and it's because are you describing how they are or you're saying how they should be? And a lot of the consultant literature is a little bit ambigu ambiguous. Are they saying how they are, or are they saying how they should be, or they're sort of a mix of both? Here, this is how they are. I don't know how they should be. That's another question. But we'll start with how they are. Okay. Um, we discovered a lot of, lot of things. These are just a couple of them. Name doesn't discriminate. Most of them are called PMOs. But if you look for a statistical relationship between the name and what they do or what they're structured, there isn't any. Even here, you'll notice that the only groups we had enough to be able to really compare was program management offices and project management offices. We could find no statistically significant differences on anything between them. Even the question, do you do program management? The program management office has done more, but the difference is not statistically significant. Um, we found variation in role. One of the questions is, what do PMOs do? And we had, uh, in this survey, we had uh, 27 different things they do, and all of them are important. Because it would have been nice if we said there's, you know, almost nobody does this, we can just forget it. No, they're all important. Variety. We did a factor analysis to reduce the 27 down to groups, and I'll we'll present very briefly here are those, those, uh, those groups. Um, here they are, I'll go down here. So there are three that were not in the groups, and then there are five groups. So that makes a total of eight. The three that were not in the groups. One of them was doing specialized things. Some PMOs have specialized resources. They have a specialist in risk management, a specialist in contract management, a specialist in schedules. And this person does things for the project managers, provides a service. Another thing that PMOs do is they manage the customer interface. And one of the things Monique found in her qualitative study, this is a very political thing. Having, managing the customer interface gives a power. And there's a, in some of the organizations, there was a struggle. Because if you give the PMO the management of the customer interface, that gives the PMO a lot of influence. So that created some jealousy with the business units. So this is a very political question. Who gets to manage the customer interface? Uh, the number in brackets was the importance on a scale from one to five. Um, and the least important on the average was uh, managing the project managers from a human resource point of view, recruiting them, evaluating them, determining their salary. And some PMOs do that. Uh, in, in this case, 22% of PMOs would have this as an important function, so it was the least important on the average, but still, you can't throw it out because it's important for about 20% of the PMOs. So these were the individual ones, and then there were five groups. These are in decreasing order of average importance. In terms, how many PMOs do this in this question? Some of these, of these functions are being filled by between 85, 75 and 85% of PMOs are doing these things. So a lot of PMOs are doing th these functions. These are the functions have to do with monitoring and controlling the performance of the projects and reporting this performance to management. Okay. Um, interesting, this, doing this was not correlated with the authority of the PMO. So some PMOs with absolutely no influence at all are doing this, they're doing a data collection exercise. They collect the data and they report it, but they have nothing to say. Some others have a lot of authority. They're collecting the data and they're making decisions about priorities, resource allocation, et cetera. So that behind this, everybody's doing it, there's quite a bit of variety in what is actually happening. Am I speaking too quickly? Because I get excited about this and it gets worse, it goes on. So I'll t I, I, and and this, is, this is not your first language, so I will try to control myself. <laughs> okay. Another thing that PMOs do, they develop standards and they train their people. And these are two very different things. But why are they associated statistically? Because if you develop a standard methodology, what are you gonna do? You're gonna train your people to use it. So if you do one, you tend to do two the other. Another thing that they do is they do multi-project management, which means program management, portfolio management, means prioritization, allocating resources, uh, coordination between projects. So they do multi-project management functions. And another thing they do, they are involved in strategic management, either participating in the management or advising the senior management. Or sometimes they have a, uh, a role to 
uh, keep up to date on what's going on in the world about project management and advise the organization as to what are the best practices that are out there, what should we be doing in terms of what, the way we manage projects. And the last, and certainly not the least, had a lot to do with organizational learning. One of the important roles of PMOs is to help the organization learn to do projects better. And, this, and so what we have here are the functions that are sort of that, uh, related to that. But they're actually, if you go back to the, um, the one on standards, this is also a lot about organizational learning. Because when you develop a methodology, what you quite often do is you look at what you're doing and you discover some things work better than others. And so you institutionalize these best practices in your standards. So there's a lot of organizational learning going on here as well. So organizational learning is a very important part of what PMOs do. And um, so those were the, the functions that we, we, we found. If you go in the literature, sometimes you'll find ones that are not on this list, but the list is reasonably complete. In our most recent study, we did a lot of validation of the questionnaires, and we talked to the people and said, does this cover what PMOs do? And everybody said, yeah, this is pretty much it. This is what we do. Sometimes another little thing, but this seems to be a reasonable map of what PMOs do in different organizations. We were looking for, okay, so is, is any of this better than anything else? So we had a measure of performance, which I'll present to you in a minute, but, uh, and all of these are correlated with performance at about the same level. It would have been really great if one of these was really strongly linked to PMO performance, and then you would give a prescription, do this and you'll, have, you'll be really good. But they're all correlated with performance at about the same level. So a prescription, the best practice, what's the best practice? Well, it depends. It would be really nice, and then this, you know, but some people say, a real good PMO should do this. Okay, some other time. So, a lot of variation in what they do. What about, uh, what about the way they're structured and where they're located in the organization? What we've called uh, form and structure. And here again, we found huge variety. This is one of the questions was, where is it located? And these are different PMOs. If you're in the, if in the IT department or if you're reporting to the senior executive, these are two different PMOs. So this is just an indication of where they are in the organization. Interestingly, is we had, one of the questions we had in the transition project, where were you located before and where were you located after? And most of them moved. So this is an indication of how much variety even within the same organization. The PMO today is going to be different from the PMO in three years. And one of the ways it's going to be different, it will probably be located someplace else in the organization. This is the question about how much decision-making authority does the PMO have. And here it seems to be more or less a normal distribution, but the variance is extreme. There are some PMOs with no authority at all. They collect data, they write reports, but nobody ever asks them some questions. And they got, in fact, we had one PMO in her qualitative studies. They were forbidden from making any recommendation of any kind. It was a very, it was a senior uh, vi executive vice president who was running the biggest part of the business and he didn't want the PMO saying anything to senior executives about his projects. So they were forbidden from saying anything. They could accumulate data, calculate averages, and that was it. But on the other end, we have these PMOs down here. These people are making decisions. And here we got about 13% of them have very powerful PMOs. So, variety. But at least here it's a more or less normal distribution um, but here's a distribution that's not normal at all. There are two extremes here. What we have down at this end, the question here was, of the projects in your part of the organization, because it's not necessarily the whole organization, the part of the organization, what percentage of those projects is the PMO involved in? So we have here down on the right, we have something like about 45% of the PMOs are saying, we're involved in all the organization's projects, or at least most of them. Down at the other end here, we have PMOs. Let me find my little dot here. Okay. We have PMOs, about 23% of them are saying, we're involved in only a small group of projects, which would tend to be a select group. It might be the strategic projects. It might be uh, projects of a certain type. It might be the innovation projects. It might be, but a small group of projects, a specialized PMO. And interesting, there are fewer in between. So it's either this or this to a large extent. So this is a variety again. Very different situations, specialized PMO or a PMO dealing with all of the organization's projects. The next question shows even more extreme variety. This, the question is, are project managers in the project management office? Do they report to the manager of the PMO? 
and here it's all either black or white. It's yes or it's no. If you look at the distribution here, you see the ones here, let me find my little red dot here, okay. Here we have those that have no project managers. If you take the none plus the less than 25%, here we have 46% of PMOs have very few project managers in them. Over here, we have 31% that have 100%. We have them all. Or if you go down to 25%, here we get 40%. So you take 40 plus 46, there are not very many in the middle. So the PMOs either have a lot of PM project managers or they don't. It was interesting, some of the qualitative study Monique was doing in one organization, a European organization, actually a Scandinavian organization, they said a PMO by definition has project managers in it. If it doesn't have project managers in it, it's not a PMO. Yeah, but you have this unit over here, they develop methodology. They said, that's not a PMO, that's a center of excellence. It can't be a PMO, it has no project managers in it. Then we went to another organization in Scandinavia as well, and they said, if it has project managers in it, it's not a PMO. A PMO, by definition, does not have project managers in it. And so each, I think part of the problem we have is most of us have been exposed to a small number of PMOs, and we think it's the one we've seen a representative. So we talk about PMOs from our experience, and we talk to somebody else who's a different experience, and then we argue who's right, who's wrong, and we mix up how they are with how they should be, and this creates the debate that we have uh, in our community about PMOs. So, the conclusion, variability. If you want to know the rest of the variability, uh, you can have a look at the, at the white paper, which is on the, on the website, okay? And then the question is, what explains the variability? Well, we looked for statistical relationships and we didn't find any. It doesn't vary by industry. It, Europe is not different from North America. Uh, it doesn't vary with organizational size, except big organizations have bigger PMOs. We're not gonna get the Nobel Prize for that one. Uh, okay. Um, and my, my surprise, I thought the PMOs that were working in an organization that did projects for external customers were different from a PMO managing projects for internal customers. No systematic difference. So, the conclusion, one of the conclusions was, it must be the internal dynamics of the organization which are deciding how it'll be. So, here I have a question for you. Uh, think of a PMO you know. Okay, you got one? Okay. Now I ask you two questions. Has this PMO changed in the last four years? Yes or no? Okay. Has the organization within, the, within which the PMO is located, has this organization changed? So in principle, you're in one of these four situations. So I'd like to know who's where. Okay. So how many people are up here, I might have a red dot again, here, they have a stable PMO in a stable organization? Is anybody in that situation? No, well, that's what I thought, okay. Okay, how about down here? Uh, your PMO has changed and so has your organization in the last four years. How many people? Okay, more than half, okay. How many people have an organization that changed but the PMO didn't change? One, two, three. Good, okay. And the final group, the the PMO stayed, the, the organization stayed the same, but the PMO changed. One person. Okay. So, the reality, okay, and if I said four years, okay, let's say I said three years, would you still be down here? How many people would still, can you find my red dot? How many people would still be down here if I said three years? About half the group. Okay, two years. Doesn't change. About the same number. So. What, this is one of the things that we discovered in this, and it's, once you've seen it, it's obvious. But it's like most results. When you've seen it, it's obvious. If you didn't find, think it, because the mindset of people thinking about best practices in PMO is there are best practices, there is a stable answer to how my PMO should be organized. And this will not change. But this doesn't make any sense. Because you're all working in organizations that change. Why should we expect to have a best practice for PMOs that's the same all the time when the organization is changing all the time? Why should the PMO be an island of stability in this great big sea of change? And it's not. We just did a little study, a representative sample here of German organizations, and it's the same everywhere else in the world. Organizations change and PMOs change. So we need to think, change the way we think about PMOs. PMOs are transitory which means what they'll, you'll, you'll, you'll have a PMO, 
Typically, it will stay stable for a year or two or three, maybe four. And then it'll go through a period of relatively rapid change and it'll become something else. Some organizations will shut them down, but most of them will just change it into something else. And this something else is significantly different that it's not the same PMO, it's a different PMO. In our study on transitions, we asked the question, how different was it radical change or, in, or incremental change? So there's a lot of radical change in the PMOs. Yeah, that was, so there's a lot of change. And this actually explains, in part, why we didn't find any relationship with geographic, why Europe and North America are the same, why banks are the same as pharmaceutical companies are the same as hospitals. Because you don't change continents every three years, and you don't change industries every three years, but you change your PMO. So industry and region are quite stable. Your company doesn't leave Germany and decide it's going to go to Korea and shut down its German operations uh, next year. Uh, and it, if you're a telecom company, you're probably not going to become a hospital. So that's stable. And if you're changing your PMO all the time, then you probably won't find a correlation whether you're a hospital or an IT company, because that's, that's not changing and the PMO's changing. That's explains to a large extent why we didn't find an, a relationship between the industry or the, uh, in, or the region and the way the PMOs are organized. Okay, so. so this is the model that we used for the research on transitions. There was a PMO. There were some things, what we call conditions, that were driving the change. There were external factors and internal factors and some issues or tensions. We called them tensions, and we did a qualitative study in Scandinavia. They don't have tensions. They don't have conflicts. They have deviations. So we settled for issues. <laughs> in North America, these are tensions. People argue in organizations about things, uh, but anyway. And then the PMO changed, and then the PMO afterwards. That was, that was the model, and this is the monograph that's coming out. Uh, we finish it probably in the next couple of weeks. And this is the one that Ralph Mueller and Thomas Blomkist became involved in. Um, and we, we didn't find it, first of all, we were looking for a pattern. Ribbon, really nice. If you have, here's my dot, this PMO and these things, why did you change it? Then you'll change it to this and we'll have. You had this kind of PMO, you had this problem, so you changed it this way. That would have been really great. We, we were looking for that pattern. We couldn't find it. The contextual variety from one organization to the next. First thing, one of the things we discovered was, why did you change it? It's never one reason. It's always a collection of reasons in this particular organization for this particular change. There isn't one thing driving the cha change. There are typically five or six things that are mentioned as reasons for changing the PMO. So the combinations that are possible in any one situation are enormous. So it's this particular dynamics of the organization is determining how they will change from what it is now to what it will be tomorrow. But we did a factor analysis, and on the average, we can say what are the, what are the things that are driving. We have a list of why the PMOs have changed, which came from a very extensive qualitative study we did. And we validated that through a long validation process, and then we got collected data. There are about 60 different reasons why they changed, but we grouped them into factors. What's on the next slide are the importance of those factors. Um, here are the performance and maturity, things having to do with portfolio method, collaboration. Change in top management was an important driver of change. If you have new top management, they'll have a new vision of the organization and the place of project management in that organization, and the PMO will get changed along with that. How long does your senior management last? A lot of organizations have changes in their senior management relatively regularly. And if the senior management is changing, the vision is probably changing. If the vision is, gonna, is changing, the PMO is going to get changed. Interesting here, the external events were not seen as an important driver. Most people see the changes the PMO as driven by the internal dynamics of the organization. The internal politics, the issues, the debates in the organization are what's driving the change. Interestingly, the senior executives see it as more being driven by outside, because they see themselves as linked to the outside world. But once you get below the senior executive level, everybody else see this is internal. Dynamics of the organization are driving the change. Uh, so what do we learn from a transition study? One of the things we learned, the PMO changes are significant and difficult. There are uh, multiple reasons for the change, as I just said. The internal dynamics, dynamics seem to be the primary driver of the changes, not adaptation to the outside world. Uh, there are no obvious pattern. So, next question. What explains PMO performance? And uh, this, the 
these, this research was largely descriptive. We just want to know what the reality is. But if we did have a measure of performance, and if we can look for correlations with that, we could have some indication of some things seem to work better than others, which I'll finish up with that. Um, the original questions, in the, we changed the way we think about PMOs over this period. We originally thought we were looking for best practices. We thought we were looking for the question, ask the question, how should my PMO be? Uh, what function should it perform? We didn't find the answers to those. Uh, but we had some assumptions. And I think I'm repeating things I already said here. Best practices are related to characteristics. This kind of PMO is better than this kind of PMO. And we didn't find very much of that, but we'll have a look at some in a minute. Um, PMOs are an islands of stability in a changing world. This doesn't make any sense either. Uh, I think I've said this already. And best practices vary by contingency factors. So those are things I've already said, but that was sort of an overview of how we change, what, how we think about PMOs during this study. Well, this is the model that is implicit in everybody's head. It's the PMO, let me get my, find my dot here, characteristics and what it does in its context that determines performance. And we found some of this, but not very much. Something else must be driving performance. And we had a measure of performance was a perceived impact of PMO on the performance of projects and programs. This is not a perfect measure of performance. And one thing we realize now is we do not have a very good understanding. What does it mean a PMO that performs well? The multiple answers to that question. It could mean they're doing the functions well. It could mean they're doing the right functions. It could mean many things. So I think, and we haven't as a community we haven't thought enough about what does it mean to have a high performing PMO. One measure would be contributing to project performance, program performance. This is the measure we've used here, but this is certainly incomplete. Um, it's a complex issue and we need a better understanding of performance. But we have this measure and we'll use this measure for the, for the study, for the results I'll present in a minute. The perceived perf impact on PMO performance, on project and program performance. So this, we did a, a regression analysis and the dependent variable was this measure of performance and what are the variables f that are either in the organizational context or the characteristics of the PMO or the role the PMO is filling. What are the variables amongst all of that that explain PMO contribution to project and program performance? Then there are very few. We had lots of variables. And there were only three that came out, or four actually. One, the first one here was performing multiple functions. As I said, the correlations with each of the functions is about the same. But we had another variable say, okay, how many important functions are you filling? That's actually a better predictor of performance than which ones you're actually doing on the average over the whole population. So very few PMOs are doing one thing. And those are doing a good job or typically doing several things. Which ones? Context specific. So that's not particularly good practice. It's good practice, sure, but what do you do? Not, not a lot of guidance there. The other, next one was having lots of, of projects within your mandate. The PMO that's specialized only deals with these projects is perceived as less valuable and could bring less to performance than the one gets involved in all the projects. But this may be a perception measure. If you're, if you're having an impact on all the organization's projects, you're probably having seen as having more impact than you only have a select group of projects. This may mean having, may, doesn't mean that you should necessarily be doing them all, but if you do, you'll probably be perceived better. The next variable is project management maturity, which is not a characteristic of the PMO. It's a characteristic of the organization. If you're in an organization that's good at project management and it thinks it's good at project management, the PMO will be seen as contributing to project and program performance. But this could be a self-fulfilling prophecy. An organization that's mature in project management values project management, values its PMO, thinks it's good at project management, and the PMO is helping it get better at project management, so this is a, a, a virtuous circle. It's more, and, and, but changing the level of maturity in project management of an organization is a very long and difficult process. So the prescription is here, you better be mature, okay. Uh, but that's not easy to change, but it might be different. If you have the job of implementing a PMO in an organization that's not mature, watch out. This is going to be difficult. I've been working with some government organizations, and our studies showed that the government organizations, at least in, in our part of the world, are not as good. In fact, the whole sample was world is the same in Europe. The government organizations are not as good in project management as the private organizations. But a lot of them are adopting PMOs. What this is saying, the, it'll probably be more difficult in the government organization for multiple reasons, including the fact they're not as good at project management. And the final one here has to do with the authority. 
that I showed you the distribution. Those with a lot of authority ha are making a better contribution to PMO project and program performance. They're having more influence. But acquiring that authority is not obvious. I'll have a look in a minute at some of the things that might contribute to that. But the PMOs that are seen as contributing to performance of the projects and programs also are PMOs that have quite a bit of power. And with this, we were able to explain 28% of the variance in PMO performance, which in social science is quite a big number. This is not insignificant. So there are some answers to what are good practices. But they're not easy to translate into my PMO should do this and it should be organized this way. That part's not as easy. The next thing we looked at was something that we called embeddedness. This is a difficult word for, Eng word for English people, and this is not your first language, so uh, what does embeddedness mean? It means that, in fact, it's not even, embeddedness is not even a word in the dictionary. It's embedded as a verb in English. What it means is well integrated into something to the extent that you become part of it. So the PMO that is well integrated in the organization to the point that becomes part of the organization is what we're measuring here. The opposite of that was a PMO that gets stuck there, not well integrated into the organization. And we had four questions in the survey we, that measure our measures of this. This is not a perfect measure, but it's the questions we had in the survey. And uh, these questions were uh, collaboration. These are in order of correlation with performance. Cooperation with other project participants. If the PMO has good cooperative relationships with the other project players and the functional managers and the senior executives and the HR department and the finance department, they'll do a better job than if they don't. The next one has expertise. This is one of the drivers of, we discovered even in the original survey, that one of the things that's driving the performance of the PMO is the good people in the PMO. And this is a result that came out very early with Monique, who had just spent 10 years in a PMO uh, as a senior project manager. And she was very surprised. This is a, because we had a qualitative study in the, in the qualitative data from the survey. And having good people was a critical factor for those that had it, and not having it, having it was a critical factor for those that did not. We also had another question. What was in, in stopping the PMO from being implemented? And they said, we didn't get good people. So there, was, there is ad hoc evidence. And I asked her, and she was very really surprised. And I said to her, you are a senior project manager. Would you leave your senior project management position to become a member of staff in the PMO and should never in a million years? So it's very difficult to convince good project people to leave their exciting world and to become staff. The organizations that do this and manage to get very good people, uh, the manager of the PMO and his staff, are doing a much better job than those that don't. So one of the critical things about the success of the PMO is getting good people to go there, and that's not obvious. What's the career path? Is this a dead end? Are you going off to a side job as a staff position, don't do anything exciting anymore? You're not delivering any revenue anymore? Are you gonna be valued in the organization? Is the organization gonna value you? So there are a lot of issues around who actually gets in the PMO, but that has a huge impact on the success of the PMO. The next thing had to do with the PMO's mission is well understood. I think what's behind this question is, if, you, if the PMO is playing a role in the organization that is clear for the other players, it's probably legitimate. If you have a role that's clear and everybody thinks it's irrelevant, that's probably not a good thing. So you have a role that's clear and everybody's judging it as relevant. This probably means that it's lined with, aligned with senior management vision. And the final point was uh, senior management support which is true of all any organizational initiative, and a PMO is an organizational initiative, and all organizational initiatives do better when they have senior management support. But these uh, together explain 48% of performance. They're explaining much more of the performance than the actual choices as to how they're structured and where they're located and what they do. So you gotta think about, is it embedded? This will have more impact than the actual choices, whether they're, how they're structured or what they're doing, except what they're doing will be, if it'll be related to their mission. So actually what they're doing needs to be perceived as being relevant and legitimate within the organization. So some other things may be affecting performance. PMOs are changing all the time. Changing a PMO is an organizational change. We learned from our study that 50% uh, of PMO transformations do not use change management. This is ridiculous. 
So at least half of the organizations do better if they just realize that every time they change their PMO, this is an important PMO, this is an important organizational change. If you use change management, you'll probably get better results. And one other way you get better results, it'll probably contribute, contribute to what I've called embeddedness. Better accepted in the organization, better integrated in the organization. So doing change management should probably have an impact on the performance of the PMO because we're changing them all the time anyway. Top management vision. Well, change in top management is a strong driver of change in, in PMOs. Uh, management has a vision, both of what is the role of project management and what is the role of the PMO in that. If I'm a manager of PMO and they get, get a job, I want to set up a PMO, what do you do? I go talk to the senior executives and I'll get them to talk about project management and their organization and how they see it. That's how the PMO should be. It needs to be aligned with that vision. And if they don't have a vision, we're going to have to help them articulate it. And that'll have more impact on performance than making any particular choice. So a management alignment with senior management vision is important. Some conclusions. And I've taken up all the time, so I'm sorry about that. Variability, form, function, and legitimacy. Uh, most PMOs are transitory, so we should stop thinking about a stable best practice. Whatever it is, it'll change within three or four years as everything else in the organization changes. The is it, PMO change is an organizational change and should be managed as such. Um, no pattern found amongst the transformations. No pattern found between PMOs in this context should be like this. And very few patterns of PMOs that do this or structure this way are better than others. Um, so that choice. So here, I was critical of the consultants, now the consultants back at, so you need consultants to help you figure this out. Uh, so there is a role for consultants, but I don't think it's writing prescriptions about what the best practice should be. Um, embeddedness is extremely important. Um, but which, how you structure it and what role you give it is important. It's not, it's just on the average, it doesn't make a difference. But in a specific context, it does. So you're going to think, in this context, given the vision of management, Given the issues in the organization, how should the PMO be structured and what should it do? Okay. And we need a better understanding, what does it mean, PMO performance? It can mean many things, and there hasn't been much thought uh, uh, on this. But we have a paper coming out in the Project Management Journal uh, quite, quite, quite soon that's referenced in the, in, the, in, the, in the chapter that you have that's had a look at this. So questions, even though there is no time. Uh, <laughs> like, Thanks, Brian, for all the bad news. So there are no best practices.